Ladies and gentlemen, um, excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, we'll begin in, in the usual way by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional land we meet. Um, here at the ANU, that's the uh, Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people, and by paying our respects um, to their elders um, past and, and present. Welcome to this evening's public lecture, two years on how Russia's war on Ukraine ends. My name is Brendan Taylor, and I'm the head of the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre here at the ANU, and it's my absolute pleasure and privilege to introduce to you tonight my friend and my colleague and my mentor, Emeritus Professor Paul Deb. It's very often said that a speaker needs no introduction, but I think it's fair to say that in Paul's case, this is absolutely true. Now, Paul's CV will be known to, to all of you. He has, of course, previously been the Deputy Secretary in the Australian Department of Defence, uh, the head of the Defence Intelligence Organisation, uh, the head of the National Assessment Staff, at, if my memory serves me correctly, at the ripe old age of 34, I believe. Um, and he was also, of course, the author of the 1986 Review of Australia's Defence Capabilities, often referred to as the, the Dib Report, whose findings and recommendations still continue to resonate very strongly today in our strategic policy and, and debates. He was also the longest serving head of the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre, serving in that role for 13 years. And Paul, I can, can assure you that that, that particular record is, is certainly uh, safe for the foreseeable, for this, uh, foreseeable future. <laughs> but I, I thought tonight I'd, I'd like to say something new in introducing Paul, because all of that will be very familiar to this, this audience. And I think there's, there's one of Paul's accomplishments that's probably not known to, to many, if, if anyone, in, in this audience. And that's that he, he recently joined the ranks of the world's social media influencers. <laughs> According to the, the very latest information that's been provided to me by the ANU Media Office, his last public lecture here at the ANU in August 2022 has received no less than 2.2 million views on the university's YouTube channel. It's truly a remarkable achievement, and, and I think that, that in itself must be a, a record for, for an academic. Paul, the bad news is that, that that sets a very, very high bar for what we can expect from this evening's lecture, um, but I have no doubt, knowing you for, for this many years, that you'll, that you'll rise to it. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Emeritus Professor Paul Deb to the podium. <laughs> On that 2.2 million, I did say uh, to Brendan uh, a few weeks ago when I learnt about it, perhaps in future we'd just charge people a dollar each and we'll have 2.2 million dollars uh, for the uh, SDSC budget. Um, the, the talk of, if I may, defence and that infamous review of mine and my colleague Brad Smith, who was a key person, and Steve Merchant, who is also here on that, as I was preparing for this, I learnt the following about Russian defence spending. It is 10% of GDP, if you include the intelligence services. Ours is a bit over two. It's 30% of the budget, and it's just gone up by 50% from last year's defence budget. And Putin has got the defence industries working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and paying accordingly. And, and wait for this, this is especially for Defence Minister Richard Miles. Putin last week in front of a gathering of defence industry said he'd instructed the Russian Ministry of Defence to pay the companies who are making weapons 80% in advance of the manufacture. Now there's one to you know, sort out speed of uh, decision making, I would have thought. Okay. We've just been discussing in the atrium there that how it is in Australia, have you noticed that this nasty war, which has been going on for two years, has fallen off the ABC national news, both TV and radio. I was supposed to be talking to ABC national radio tomorrow morning at 8.30, they've cancelled it for some other uh, priority. I'm not dismissing the Middle East and what's going on there, 
But you've seen how it's slipping off the priority list and people are getting a bit bored, which is unfortunate, because it's not boring and it's very dangerous. So as Russia enters its third year of this war against Ukraine, we need to ask, how will it end? I'll examine the prospects for a military end to the war, and let me stress I'm not a military person. And what are the realistic chances of a ceasefire or even an enduring peace? I'll then examine what are the risks of this war extending further in Europe. And my view is there are real risks of that, real risks. And finally, I ask the question, how can Russia be defeated? There's an increasing view in this town by people with no background in Russia or the Soviet Union, let alone their weapon systems, and saying we, meaning the West, must see Russia defeated. I want to discuss with you, and I'd welcome different views, how do you defeat a country with 1,500 strategic nuclear warheads and another 4,500 in various states of uh, storage and reserve? Most days I watch an American daily assessment of the war it's called the Institute for the Study of War. It's fairly right-wing, I've got to say to you. It produces tremendous, overwhelming amounts of information, battlefield by battlefield, weapon by weapon. But on Saturday, the anniversary of this war, that daily report said the following to me, and I quote, The situation today is grave, but it is far from hopeless. Russian forces have gained the initiative across the theater and are making gains. Now, for that organization to admit that is quite revolutionary. They are seriously, um, for obvious reasons, not just anti-Russian, but very careful what they say about Ukraine. Also of the weekend, from my social media sources, I find an American assessment that says, as we speak, Russia is setting conditions to conduct hybrid warfare operations in the Baltic states and Finland. It doesn't say they're going to war, it's saying they're stating the conditions of. And you might also not know, in the independent country of Moldova, which is between Ukraine and Romania, um, there's a breakaway province which has occurred since 1991 and the disintegration of the Soviet Union called Transnistria. And there is word that that is Putin's next objective, to make that a separate state of Russia. So there is a lot going on. Before I start, let me just recap with you, for those of you who did read the August 22 speech, what are Putin's excuses and explanations for going to this war? Because it's important both as an academic and in my previous profession of intelligence officers, you need to be able to get inside this person's mind. You don't agree with the person, and I certainly don't. I think he's a nasty piece of work. Um, and his, his reasons are as follows. First, the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 was the most serious geopolitical catastrophe in modern history, he says. And we need to remember that the Soviet Union in the first year of um, Russia, the GDP in one year fell by 40%. Inflation was 1,900%. People's savings meant nothing. Russia lost half its population of 280 million, 180, 140 million separated, and it lost 70% of its territory, which is most of Australia as a comparison. It's certainly a bigger chunk than Western Australia. He does not accept that there is a separate country called Ukraine, even though the then government under Yeltsin, in the famous meeting in the um, Belarusian woods, the leaders of Russia, um, uh, Belarus, met and they decided that there would be separate countries. 
One of Yeltsin's advisors hauled him back and said, you haven't discussed with Ukraine the situation in Crimea. He said that will be handled later in international legal discussions. Well, it hasn't been handled with international legal uh, conditions. Second and associatedly, Putin believes there is no such country as Ukraine, even though his country, under Yeltsin, uh, agreed there was an independent country with independent boundaries. In a piece he wrote um, a year and a half ago, whether he wrote it or it was ghosted, I don't know, he, um, he says, we are one country, one people, one language, one Russian Orthodox faith. Well, demonstrably, if that was ever true, which I don't think it was, it's now certainly not the case in Ukraine. You can imagine what people's attitudes are. But it tells you about, with both the catastrophic disintegration of the former Soviet Union as a great power, the humiliation of Russia and his view that he wants to rebuild it. Solzhenitsyn, not some left-wing communist, before he died and the Russian Soviet Union had disintegrated, called for a, a new country called, which combined Russia, great Russians, Ukraine, little Russians, and Belarus, white Russians. He called for that before he died. As for the rest, he said, who's interested in Kazakhstan, the Central Asian republics, or the ca Caucasian ones? They're not Russian. So, you know, there are there's complexities in this. Third, Putin's view that NATO's expansion to the borders of the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, is an act of military aggression. And look, many of you may have different views. I had the Russian ambassador here in Canberra, Moiseev, say to me in 91, as the economy was collapsing and inflation was rampant, Paul, you in the West need to have a Marshall Plan of economic aid because we are in a bad shape and it's going to get worse. And if you're not careful, if you don't help us financially, you may end up with the Weimar Republic. <coughs> well, where are we now? Teetering on the edge of it, in my view. And there were people in the American administration, the George Bush senior administration, he was a, a serious president, <laughs> unlike some others we can think of. And his secretary of treasury said to George Bush, in answer to a question, can you get a Marshall Plan to together? The secretary of the treasury, I've forgotten his name, said to the president, no, Mr. President, I think we shouldn't be helping them at all. We should put them in the direction of being a third-rate country, economically, and with all that, that means militarily. So there are the main reasons he articulates the cat catastrophic collapse of the Soviet Union, no such country as Ukraine, NATO's expansion to the very borders, and Ukraine's ambition to have been a member of NATO is seen by Putin as a first order strategic challenge. A spear aimed at the heart of Russia is the sort of language he uses. In addition to those four main excuses, explanations, he has of late introduced a fifth one. You remember at the very beginning he talked about the Nazification of Ukraine, whatever that meant. It had some truth in the Second World War, but certainly not since then. But now the new theme is, which is going down much better with the Russian population, and 62% of a reasonably reliable opinion poll are saying that 62% of Russians uh, believe there is a new strategic threat to Russia, Holy Mother Russia, from the West. The West is seeking to destroy Russia, and Russia is now fighting for its, quote, very survival, unquote. 62%. Okay. I might turn then to the issues of 
the war and how it's going and so on. Just bear with me for a moment. You'll notice there have been two phases of this war. At the very beginning, 24th of February 2022, most of the pundits, and I was getting advice from colleagues, former colleagues, that there was 175,000 Russian troops on the very border. And then once I was told very discreetly that we detected the movement of blood banks and hospitals up to the border, that was good enough for me. And I went public and said, he's about to do it. I since learnt that a couple of weeks earlier in a classified briefing of the Congress, the then chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said exactly the same. 72 hours, they'll be in Kiev, Kiev. Game, set and match. And how could we get it so wrong? There's been an intelligence failure in the West. And it's happened before, by the way, on allied intelligence assessments of the Soviet Union as being this military superpower with no weaknesses, when in fact it had plenty of weaknesses. So the issue of what's going to happen in future, there was round about the Northern Hemisphere summer last year, could you remember there was a talk of a massive Ukrainian offensive. Well, it ain't happened, has it? It has not happened. And that's not a criticism of the Ukrainians. I think there was over-expectation, as usual, from our American friends. They wanted to impose on the Ukrainians maneuver warfare. And with, unless you have air superiority and electronic warfare superiority, you're not going to do that. You've got to remember there's still the DNA in the Ukrainian military of their Russian heritage. The new commander-in-chief of the Ukrainian army was trained in the military in Russia, and he was born in Russia. You know, and one would be surprised if there aren't some issues there. Um, so that huge maneuver to evict, evict the Ukrainians out of Ukraine has not occurred. Not that Putin has done well. From the very first day, the name of the suburb where the airport is outside of Kiev, I've forgotten, but that's where it all started. When, you know, Ukrainians got hold of weapon systems, both military and civilians, and the Russians made no real impact at all, including a particular um, special force that I've been watching for years, the 71st Airborne Guards Division, the elite of the elite, who went into uh, um, uh, Afghanistan and killed the then communist leadership and put in another one. They went into Georgia in 2008, and they were dropped into Kiev and had to scuttle out. And this is one of the elite divisions. You can see that Putin's hanging on to Crimea. I, by the way, my personal view is he ain't going to negotiate on that. And with apologies to any people of Ukrainian descent here, 90% recurring of Russians will believe that Crimea is Russian. Won't bore you with too much of the history, but at the time of Catherine the Great and her great lover, Pachomkin, she said to him, my predecessor, Peter the Great, has just defeated the most powerful country in the north of Europe, Sweden. And we've got access to the Baltic. We now need to go to the Black Sea. Well, the then Crimea, at that time, in the late 1700s, was occupied by, guess whom? Muslim Turks. And there were three major battles, all of whom Pachomkin won. And he had a bit of a classical Greek background, so he created the following cities. And listen to them, you will know them. Mariupol, Kherson, 
Odessa, Nikolaev. And Catherine the Great said to him, this is new Russia, Novorossiya, just cross the border. And that's how the word Ukraine was derived. And there's debate about this, Ukraina, beyond the border. And it was very lightly populated, black earth, rich soil, agricultural with great potential, breadbasket of <laughs> the Soviet Union, it should have been. So I don't see him giving up Crimea under any conditions. When the little brown men and women with no badges of rank went in in 2014, you recall, there were huge crowds, organized of course by Putin's people, in the main cities in Russia, chanting, Krim Nash, Crimea is ours. Krim Nash, repeated. So it remains to be seen if Russia can now turn the military tables and transition to a victory of sort over the Ukrainian forces. My personal view is, as a non-military person, is I don't think there's any victory in sight either side. I just don't see that. It is almost classic First World War now, isn't it? What is it? Trenches, trench warfare, anti-tank devices. Huge minefields. And yet, the equivalent of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Gerasimov, who is the senior military person to this day in wartime Russia, wrote a piece before all this happened, just a few years before, said, in future there will be no such conventional conflict of, of armies. It will all be done remotely, with drones and overhead intelligence, and there will be no face-to-face -face battle. Well, how wrong can you get it? How wrong can you get it? One of our Australian commentators, Mick Ryan, who was a major general until relatively recently in the ADF, um, has written a piece in the American journal Foreign Affairs, who, and he's not pro-Russian. It's called the article, Russia's Adaptation Advantage. And he's saying that the Russians really got caught flat-footed and it was a dismal defeat in those early months. But now, with this trench warfare, and it's more than just trench warfare, they've adapted and at present we have a stalemate. And it may well exist for quite a significant time. He goes on to say, Mick Ryan, that if Russia's strategic adaptation continues to persist without an appropriate Western response, meaning the $60 billion of American military aid that's clogged up in Washington, our great and powerful ally. Without an appropriate Western response, response he says, quote, the worst that can happen in this war is not a stalemate, it is a Ukrainian defeat. By the way, in the article, he does not go on to look uh, at not only from his view defeat is still a possible outcome for Ukraine but it does not address what the implications are of a Russian victory for the future strategic stability of Europe which I'll turn to shortly but before I do moving on to the military situation you've heard mutterings in the press around the world that there's a possibility for a ceasefire Negotiations aimed at an enduring peace. Zelensky's tried that on with uh, a bunch of um, developing countries and others, but no Russians present. There have been some rumours recently that Putin may be interested in a ceasefire and territorial negotiations. I think that is a KGB trap. He is not interested in negotiations. He's not interested in the ceasefire. It, ceasefire. He thinks time's on his side. He's got a population of 140 million. Ukraine's is significantly less than 40. It used to be 40, about 6 million people have sc scooted. There's been some speculation in the UK Financial Times, an honorable newspaper of late, that Ukraine might have to bear the bitter price of a permanent peace 
in which Russia retains part or all of its occupied territories. In other words, Crimea, Donetsk, Lugansk, Zaporozhye, and so on. But I would observe that that would turn Ukraine into a weak, truncated state, nominally independent, but at Moscow's mercy. So I just don't see it happening. On the 22nd of January this year, Russia's Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, stated that Russia, open quote, has always been ready for negotiations, unquote, but he went on to make it perfectly clear that, quote, Russia is only interested in negotiations that result in the removal of the current Ukrainian, Ukrainian government from power, close quote. Putin himself consistently refused to recognize there's any such separate country. And he refuses to recognize that he will be in negotiations with Zelensky. Zelensky doesn't exist. I think half Putin's problem is, unlike in the old Soviet days, he doesn't have a Politburo, a ministry, who you will recall voted Khrushchev out of power. There is no such Politburo, no such group of ministers. They're just his acolytes, his sidekicks, who he ridicules in public. Like on the morning, five o'clock in the morning of the invasion, he said to the chief of, of intelligence, Narishkin, stop stuttering and going on. Say something I can understand on international TV. This bloke is the czar of all the Russias like nothing we've seen other than Stalin. The said Sergei Narishkin, the director of SVR, the Russian Foreign Intelligence Agency, said on the 28th of January, quote, the Kremlin is not interested in any settlement short of the complete destruction and eradication of the Ukrainian state. So I don't see Putin under any circumstances, and I could be wrong, not for the first time, of him handing back Crimea to the Ukrainians. The only way I can see him perhaps conceding to return the 18% of Ukraine's territory that Russia currently occupies is a decisive Russian defeat on the battlefield. Whatever does that mean? Even then, my view is that rather than concede victory to Ukraine, Putin is more likely to perhaps broaden the war to a war in Europe against Russia's neighbors, such as Poland, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Just remember the Baltic Republics, now independent countries, vibrant democracies, I have no criticism, were part of the Soviet Union. And Poland, as Medvedev, Medvedev the former prime minister and president, <laughs> sidekick, has recently said, Poland is a traditional enemy of ours. And he goes back to what Putin calls the time of troubles. You may not believe what I'm about to tell you, on Australian historical standards, but every Russian secondary school educated person knows what the time of troubles is. Smutnoya Vremya. 1606, for 10 years, there was a disintegration between the end of one Tsarist dynasty, the Rurikids and uh, Ivan the Terrible, and the takeover by the Romanovs for 300 years. And there was a succession of short-term Tsars. The nobility couldn't really agree and it meant that because of an instability at the very top in the Kremlin, foreign states took advantage of a weak and distracted Russia. This is Putin's point. Sweden invaded the medieval city of Novgorod, where elements of democracy amongst voting nobility first started. More importantly, the Poles militarily occupied the Kremlin, let me repeat that. The Poles militarily occupied the Kremlin and said to the nobility, we've got a new Tsar for you. This new Tsar is known in the history as the false Dmitri. Warsaw told the Kremlin, he's Russian, he speaks Russian, and he's orthodox. The nobility rapidly found out that was, his Russian was heavily accented um, Polish. Even worse, he was Roman Catholic. The Orthodox Church does not get on with the Catholic Church. Um, and so they chopped him up into pieces while he's still alive, stuffed his remains down a couple of cannons in the Red Square, and shot his remains in the general direction of Warsaw. 
Look, I'm sorry to bore you with something that's 400 years old, but if you think Russians don't remember this, they do. And he, Putin plays this like a violin. Now, this vision is in a particular room inside that glorious Kremlin. I've only seen a few rooms. It's called the Faceted Chamber, dates from the medieval times. That's where Ivan the Terrible murdered his son. And Putin's going into all this history. You saw in that recent interview with that extreme right-wing American TV journalist who asked Putin a question. 30 minutes later, Putin's going on about the time of troubles. On the 11th of this month, the Secretary General of NATO, Jen Stoltenberg, warned that Europe needed to, and I quote, arm itself for a possible decades-long confrontation, unquote, with Russia. About the same time, the Defence Minister of Denmark warned that, open quote, it cannot be ruled out that within three to five years, Russia will test the strength of Article 5 of NATO solidarity, close quote. So this brings me to the subject of what are the risks of this war extending further into neighbouring NATO countries. I am not underlined arguing here that Putin would casually enter in such, into such a high-risk military conflict. But as I have argued at the beginning of this essay, Putin will simply not accept the existence of a separate nation-state called Putin under any circumstances. On its borders and becoming a full member of the EU and NATO. One possibility we might have to face up to is that he might decide to use tactical nuclear weapons. He's got about 2,000 landmines, torpedoes, aerial stuff. The Americans have virtually got none. Both he and Kremlin leaders such as former Prime Minister Medvedev, as well as international security advisor of a Russian contact of mine, Sergei Karaganov, are increasingly and repeatedly being raucous about threatened use of nuclear weapons. Now, a lot of this is for effect. It's for threatening. But the current director of CIA, who was the man who said, you need to get inside Putin's mind, before he became director, he was ambassador in Moscow, and a good one. And he says that you, you cannot dismiss the possibility that Russia might go nuclear. He doesn't say it as crudely as that. So I've mentioned Poland and so on being traditionally a historic enemy and it's been talked about as such in recent months. There's been recent threats to the Baltic Republics about them forcing some of them, their Russian populations, to undergo a lo local language test if they are to continue to be Russian citizens. They are in what Putin calls the near abroad, the former Soviet Union. And he's using that like a violin domestically. On the other side of my argument, Putin has not yet attacked NATO countries such as Poland and Germany, who continue to facilitate very sophisticated advanced weapons from Europe and the United States through to the Ukraine. I don't exclude him doing that. So my bottom line is that if push ever comes to shove, Russia will not accept a battlefield defeat in Ukraine. That's just my view. And the fact is that if push ever does come to shove, escalation to a full-scale war with Europe cannot be casually dismissed. I've quoted to you the current director of the CIA. It would be foolish to dismiss escalatory nuclear risks entirely, quote-unquote. But people like the CIA director seem to p casually pass over that by describing Putin's war as a strategic failure, which has exposed Russia's military weaknesses, quote unquote all that, that this may result in itself in Putin escalating to the unthinkable. That brings me to the question of if the aim of the US and its NATO allies is to defeat, quote unquote, Russia, how will this be achieved, as I've said, against a country with 1,500 strategic nuclear warheads? I'm just looking at the time. 
And what would a defeated Russia look like? Would it be a Weimar Germany? Remember what happened to Germany after the Treaty of Versailles? And Germany was for what were thought to be good and moral reasons by the French, the Brits and the Americans, forced into huge financial retributions costs and were not allowed more than a very small number of people in their military. We all know what happened after the Treaty of Versailles 29, uh, 1919. 1933, Hitler's in power. 39, we're at war. Would it be a Weimar Germany looking for revenge? Make no mistake about the unique sense of Russians about their Russianness. The problem is they don't know where Russia begins and ends. Because unlike us, surrounded by water, it begins and ends wherever you think it should or might. So I think these imponderables by themselves should leave us deeply concerned. And we need to pay more attention to it, unlike our newspapers. But can we conceive of other outcomes under a new Russian leadership? If Putin were overthrown? Well, Prigozhin denies that he was seeking to overthrow Putin. But you saw how angry Putin was, accused Prigozhin of treason, then hauled Prigozhin a few days later with his second in commands to talk. And then Prigozhin gets into his private airplane and all of a sudden it explodes. You know? My own view is that if there was any such new Russian leadership, it would be more likely to be Putin Mark II, God bless us, than some form of Western Democrat with all that means for a peaceful outcome. There are people in this town, no names, no pack deal, drill, who believe we, meaning the West, because we're not making much contribution, we need to see Russia defeated, we need to see Putin killed, and then I presume a Navalny Mark II comes in and introduces Russia to democracy <coughs> for the first time since the very early months of the end of the Soviet Union and the early stages of the Russian Civil War. There is not going to be a democracy, foreseeably, in my view. There might never be one. So, what does all this mean for Australia? Just got a few minutes left. Ukraine in itself, and the challenge to the international rules-based order, whether you believe in it or not, I do, to the sacred board borders of an internationally recognized state, recognized by the United Nations and Russia itself, amongst others, called Ukraine, is not to be sneered at. I am not saying, by the way, that Ukraine, I've never been there. When I used to go to the Soviet Union as a declared intelligence officer and an undeclared one, um, I used to think that this place is really impossible to understand. Where does it begin and end? Do they see themselves as Europeans? No. A lot of my friends in Russia do, but a lot, a lot increasingly now are dismissing Europe. Why? 64% believe that Europe is wanting to dismantle Russia, and they're calling themselves Eurasians. I mean, it's an even more silly phrase than the Indo-Pacific, in my view. Eurasians, what does that mean? Well, it means obviously China, and who's the dominant power there? Well, it's clear. But it's a clear move to the East. We should not make the mistake, if the balloon does go up, we have a small, pathetically small defense force, 60,000, you know, about half a decent crowd at an AFL grand final in Melbourne. We've always had about six battalions, about 11 surface ships, about six submarines, and about 100 combat aircraft. Yes, they're all more modern and more capable, but that's where about we are. If the balloon goes up in Ukraine, that's for NATO. That's what Article 5 is about. We need to be getting ready for, and I'll come to this, if China invades a dramatically democratic country. Putin's view of Ukraine is gross and stupid. But although it's had six changes of leadership since it became an independent state, it has been a corrupt, violent country. Recently, you know, Zelensky sacked 
all the heads of military recruitment in Ukraine, 16 of them, for corruption. He recently has put on trial the chief judge of the Supreme Court for, guess what, corruption. They're making progress. Let me not be just, you know, too uh, critical. They're making progress. But the democracy, you go to Taiwan, I've been there four times, met two presidents. The democracy, it's a vivid democracy, changes of government, no fixing the ballot boxes, a proper judiciary, and so on. That should be our focus. Not that it would be trivial either. Secondly, it is crucial, and the world is watching, is the United States going to weaken over Ukraine? Are they going to use the excuse of the $60 billion held up in the Congress? And in any case, if, and it's not just to be dismissed, we get a second Trump, he might do a deal with his friend, authoritarian mate, Putin. And that would be the end of the game for nearly 50 million Ukrainians. So it's important for the US alliance, the world is watching it. Finally and seriously, there's the issue of whether the weaknesses of Russia's military performance have had any impact at all on the attitude of China's President Xi Jinping towards going to war with Taiwan. I would hope that Xi Jinping would understand what a poor military performance his Russian friend for life, President Putin, has shown to the world. Xi needs to understand that some of the inherent weaknesses in the Russian military establishment are also deeply reflected in the DNA of the Chinese People's Liberation Army, given their common origins. These weaknesses include the distrust by authoritarian leaders in both Russia and China of delegating tactical battlefield decisions to NCOs, because they don't have NCOs, that's how much they don't trust um, battlefield decisions. The corruption of both countries, of their logistics supply and their defence industry, in both Russia and, mark my words, in China. Invading Taiwan across the 200 kilometres or so of the Straits of Ta Taiwan is an infinitely greater military challenge than walking across Ukraine's borders with Russia. Infinitely greater challenge. Authoritarian leaderships in both China and Russia are typified by deep-seated despotism and pervasive corruption that saps the fighting strength of their armed forces. Most recently, President Xi has sacked his foreign minister, his defence minister, and eight senior generals, including in the strategic nuclear ro rocket forces. In what? The strategic nuclear rocket forces. For what? Corruption. Moreover, it's more than 44 years now since China has absolutely used military power. I remember as an intelligence officer, December 79, we watched four Chinese divisions, we had the call signs, come across the North um, Vietnam's border and teach a communist Vietnam a lesson, which it failed at. So China has no experience of combat. It's all right having pretty little exercises. That is not the same. So Xi, in my view, needs to consider the clear risk in any serious military conflict between America and China over Taiwan. There is also, and I'm sorry to harp on this, a clear and present danger of devastating escalation to the use of nuclear weapons. Those in this town who say that will never happen and America will quit beforehand, well, if that's the case, that's not America we want to be an ally with. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Paul. There's a, a, a lot of food for thought in, in that, but you've also been characteristically disciplined and, and left us about 15 minutes for, for questions. So if I could maybe invite uh, questions for the four. Um, I know many of you will be known for four, but uh, just as a courtesy, if you just identify yourself when you're uh, asking a, a question to Paul, that would be much appreciated. Yep. Hey, Paul, thanks very much for the presentation. My name's Jeremy from Defence. Huh? Just wondering if uh, negotiations that do happen, would the Ukrainian people accept that with Zelensky? Perhaps have to resign if the, the feeling of outrage from the Ukrainian people was enough? Yeah. Look, I've never been there, as I say. I'm not sure under current conditions I particularly want to. And uh, I'm one of the 120 crit critic critiques of Russia who is permanently banned forever visiting Russia again. Um, Zelensky's popularity, as you know, is very high. It's, you've got to take your hat off 
from a person who was a comedian in a show acting to be a president to actually get elected. And the seriousness with which he, 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 he handles high-level international meetings at the highest levels and deliberately wears, you know, a khaki t-shirt and trousers. Um, not many others would get away with that in the White House or elsewhere. Um, and he, he is very popular. But so is the now departed uh, senior general, Zaluzhny. And you've heard me say that his person who's taken over from Miss got a name like Skritsky, born in Russia, militarily trained in Russia. I'm not saying is an agent, but don't tell me there aren't agent, Russian agents deep inside Ukraine. So I think the answer to your question is, we're in a no-go situation. It's not just the Russian side, but for reasons I understand and accept, the Ukrainian side. And that then leaves us with either escalating military stuff with all the dangers I've outlined, um, or we just live permanently with a long, lingering, conventional conflict. You saw this morning, um, Zelensky announced there have been 31,000 Ukrainian soldiers killed. He will not give the numbers wounded, because that, as he says, would reveal the state of the population demography to the Russians. The latest British intelligence estimate that I've seen for the Russians is about 88,000 dead, um, and a total dead and wounded over two years of um, 300,000. While I think about it, one important thing I forgot to say to you, if you'll forgive me. So, compare Putin strutting around, and the most important holiday in Russia is the patriotic Second World War defeat of Nazi Germany, in which the Russians lost 27 million dead, 13 million of whom were German. So here we're precisely at year two of this war in Ukraine. At year two, in the Soviet Union's war against Germany, it had reoccupied the whole eastern part of Ukraine, including uh, uh, Kiev, Kharkov, forgive my Russian pronunciation, and down the Dnieper River to uh, Jessa and Kherson. Two years. Two years and six months, the Battle of Stalingrad occurred, and that was the beginning of the end for the German army. Surely Putin, if he compares where he is now, and of course he can't be exact, exact. he's not using total mobilization like Stalin did, but there he stands measured, a draw after two years, with a country that in his own words is a pathetic non-entity. Right in the centre of Europe, you have Hungary as perhaps the most maverick member both of the European Union and of NATO. What do you think Putin would now most want from Viktor Orban? Look, again, I've never been, I never went to anywhere in Eastern Europe, again, for reasons you would understand. The only place you went to was Moscow. Um, he's clearly a problem for the EU and NATO. Um, he's significantly right-wing, and there are some other worrying right-wing elements occurring. Have you noticed Germany? Is it called the Alternative for Germany? Yes. The right-wing organization? Well, even the sort of ain't faint hint that there's now a significant group of Germany voting right-wing is a terrible nightmare. So, I think on the good side, Another thing I got wrong, I thought NATO would just go to pieces when the mighty Red Army went in in 72 hours, sorted out Kiev, put in a puppet government, game set and match, Ukraine, welcome back to the Soviet Union. NATO has been remarkable. I mean, they've got some backbone. They are actually, as a total expenditure, both military and economic, marginally outspending America. But when you come to the military kit, there is no comparison. And as other people in this audience will tell you, that's because American military kit is by and large so superior to most of the European stuff, not all of it. So I think that issue that you've raised, it remains to be seen how NATO would stand together if, and I hope I'm wrong, Putin decides to have a crack at Poland or the Baltic republics. The Baltic countries are small countries. 
from the nearest NATO border in Estonia to St. Petersburg is Canberra to Cooma. Now, if you're a defence planner, you would really focus you, wouldn't it? You know, Canberra to Cooma. That's what happens when you share land borders. Yep. Brexit itself expanding over Asia and more new superpowers. How do you see it changing the dynamic of the war itself? Can you just repeat that? Please? Tell us about the BRICS organization in Russia. Oh, yeah. Sorry, my hearing's not brilliant. Have changed the dynamics of the yeah. Did, it, did I summarize that correctly? Look, I'm not sure the BRICS amounts to much, quite frankly. You know, um, uh, It is one that Russia increasingly seems to have influence over, but when push comes to shove, it's clearly China's. Um, you know, a lot of these international organizations, um, the talk shops, and when it really, when push comes to shove militarily. Um, for 11 years on behalf of foreign affairs, I was a member of the ASEAN Regional Forum, 26 countries on a particular issue called preventive diplomacy. It was a total, utter waste of my time. The ASEAN countries, when academics use the word agency, other than that, and curate, um, <laughs> We have a selection of Christmas nuts for you, Paul. Uh, they've been specially curated for you. It's said on a bottle recently. <laughs> and when a, a, a fairly well-known senior Southeast Asian academic professor said to me, I'm writing a book about how ASEAN will have decisive agency for Southeast Asia, I burst out laughing. I said, have you ever negotiated with them? They can't agree on the time of day. Now, I'm not saying the BRICS is as bad as that. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which was conjured up by China and Russia, has some utility, but increasingly, you know, Putin, particularly if things start, you know, this, this stalemate continues on, is looking by, like the supplicant to Xi Jinping, isn't he? The supplicant. That's where the economic power is. They can handle Russia's oil and pay whatever price, and they can even send some carefully, some military equipment. But you've noticed Xi Jinping, has been very careful about not endorsing Russia's war on Ukraine. Careful. Is the um, lady up the back in the white chair? Hi, uh, I'm Maria Adamska. I'm a school of biology, but I'm also Polish and Ukrainian, so I'm listening with great interest to what you are saying. And what I understand is that there is no hope, really. Is that uh, because if you say, uh, Putin has quite highlighted with attacking everybody around Ukraine, that would be Poland, Baltic States, and so on. But you also <coughs> agree that if Ukraine got weakened, then it would really encourage him to keep going. Yeah. And if he would not negotiate with Zelensky, then obviously once Russia can dictate to Ukraine who the president can be, yeah. that's not the state, that's not independent state. That's game, set, and match. So, is there anything that can go right in this case? Or Look, just waiting to see? let me stress, I'm not an expert, haven't been to Ukraine, and um, uh, Putin is stupid, and you would know this infinitely better than me, to dismiss Ukrainian language, history, culture. Um, it was deliberately crushed by Pachomkin and um, the, uh, the Tsarina uh, that sent him there. Um, in as late as the 19th century, there were great Ukrainian poets and literature peoples, I recall it, not that I've read any. I read, you know, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky and all that stuff. Um, and the Russians, you know, deliberately crushed that in, in, in Ukraine. Um, so it's got a proud history of its own. I don't speak the language, but obviously the Ukrainians believe it's significantly different. It is... It's what? Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, um, and as you well know, the Uniate Orthodox faith is very different from the Russian Orthodox. Correct me if I'm wrong, the Uniate Orthodox faith is Orthodox in the procedures and the language, but it looks to its leadership to the Pope in Rome. And of course, for the Russians, that is a no-go area. So look, I do hope that I'm wrong, I, you've got a very good ambassador here. He's working hard on, you know, 
second hand helicopters, bush rangers, uh, Hawkeye vehicles, and so on. But you know, you've, it's, I think it's hard for him to understand, I've tried to tell him this. We have a small defense industry. Most of it is foreign owned and some very good companies. But when you look at the Australian owned ones, and even the foreign owned ones, our actual manufacturing capability is very small. So we don't have the European background. And the Europeans are struggling. You know, Germany's promising a million 150 mil artillery shells, and it's recently admitted it hasn't even started yet, and it may not get there. So look, I do hope your country of birth um, is successful, because if the opposite is really serious for world peace. We've got time for one, one more question. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I have a question about your thoughts uh, for the lessons of Australia's defense industry uh, and the war in Ukraine. As we have seen, uh, the war in Ukraine has really tied the Western and even American defense industry in trying to fulfill the weapons and ammunition needs for Ukraine. And now that the Kalkar region is also facing the threat from China, uh, what do you think that Australia's defense industrial policy should be uh, in preparing uh, for the potential war in the region? Uh, in doing what, sorry? In, uh, what should Australia's defense industrial policy be uh, learning from the lessons from Ukraine uh, in addressing the potential threat that we face in the region right now? Uh, yeah. Look, uh, it's a long time since I've been in harvest, harness in defence, but I keep reasonably up to date. Um, uh, our primary focus of strategic concern, as the Defence Strategic Review has recently said, and it's not new, it's been like this for 30 odd years, is the defence of Australia. It's a continent. We're the only country with a continent unto ourselves, sparsely populated. It includes the Northeast Indian Ocean approaches including Cocos Keeling Islands, where we need to build longer airstrips for the P-8s. It includes the whole of Southeast Asia, both continental and maritime. In other words, including places like um, uh, uh, Vietnam, and the whole of the South China Sea, with all that that implies. And it includes the whole of the South Pacific, certainly as far out as Fiji. And we often forget, not that it's primarily military, but we have claims to the Southern Ocean parts of Antarctica. So that's, for a country of 28 million people, that's frankly more than enough if, if things start to go wrong. And, you know, it's common statement now, and I don't disagree with it, that we're now in a much more difficult, challenging and uncertain strategic situation than when I was working 30 years ago reviewing Australia's defence policy. 30 years ago, we knew that short of nuclear war, there were very few countries that could seriously damage us. The following countries in Asia were not capable of building the massive conventional forces to attack us. Japan, China, <coughs> India. Hmm? They just didn't have the capability. And we would see from intelligence sources, of which we have plenty and seriously good ones, several years for them to build up the unique fingerprint of a long-range amphibious assault force, which you would meet as they came further and further south with their vulnerable logistics resupply, with strike. That has all changed. Um, I worried a bit about an Indonesia going bad on us, which it had um, under Sukarno, when it was armed to the teeth by Soviet jet fighters that were better than ours, Soviet bombers that were better than ours, and Soviet um, submarines that were better than ours. That's why we bought the F-111s, strike aircraft, and that's why we bought the Oberon submarines. The situation now is seriously more uncertain than that. The problem I see is, and it's easy to climb on the bandwagon, but there's something badly going wrong in my former department in relations between the minister and the bureaucrats. It is the first time we've had it splattered across the front pages of the newspapers. Kim Beasley could have done that with me, given that for a year, the then secretary and chief of defense force, the two most senior advisors, couldn't agree on the time of day about four structure priorities for the defense of Australia. He didn't. He gave them to me, and we never mentioned them in our report. How it has got to this situation, and talks of defense not reaching excellence, is deeply disturbing. The issue of long-range strike 
is a contentious one. My personal view is we need long range strike missiles with ranges in excess of 2,000 kilometers so we could hold off a potential threatening force at distance. I see we're putting in some orders for those and there's talk about some manufacture but it certainly won't be at that level. It takes the Department of Defense now three years from the hint of a decision about buying something to actually come to a contract. I'm not saying we should have some corrupt, you know, acquisition system. You need checks and balances. Um, but I think it's all gone far too far. And in the end, um, we're playing the violin while Rome burns. And it is China, frankly. Well, thank, thank you all so much for coming along this evening. I think you all agree that we've been treated to um, a real masterclass. Paul, in your, the, my opening um, introduction for you, I, I outlined the, the kind of three main pillars in, in your career, and I think that those pillars are, are, have been very, very evident in your, your lecture tonight. You've had the, the clarity and the succinctness of a, of a policy officer. You've had the real country expertise and depth of an intelligence officer. But you've also had that, that real rigour of, um, of the wonderful scholar that you have been here at the ANU for many years, and we're still very fortunate to, to have you here. So thank you so much for, for this evening, and if you'd um, join with me in thanking Paul for a while. <laughs>